All right, I want to welcome everybody uh, to our second. We've done this is we actually did this webinar once before, but um, things have changed. There is new news, there is updates, and we're super excited to have Chris Farrell from Lysio and Jamie Beresford from Practice Protect to help us work through um, how to how to think about email and the devil in the email. Uh, behind the scenes, I'm Allison Ball from Lysio. We've got Justin Das from Protect, Practice Protect, and we'll be helping with Q&A. So welcome, everybody, and I want to turn the floor over to Chris and Jamie. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Jamie, you ready to go? I am. I am. Looking very excited. Huge turnout for this one, so I'm looking forward to it. Let's, let's get into it. Let's do it. Okay, let's talk about our uh, learning objectives here. We'll do that first. So... Um, really, when we think about email, um, we think about what we're doing today, it's really about how fraud happens. So we'll go through that. We'll talk about some real life examples of hacks. I think we're both dealing with firms daily um, who, are, who are working to keep the bad guys at bay and, and certainly talking to a lot of firms who, uh, who have had incidents. So we'll be sharing a lot of uh, what we've seen um, through partners and, and firms. And we're also going to talk about the practical things we can do every single day to minimize risk. Let's keep uh, let's keep the bad guys um, really from making any money. How does that sound? So let's start there. So the facts around email security. Um, let's start with some data. Everybody likes data, right? Let's talk about BEC, business email compromise. BEC, business email compromise. Uh, it's the most damaging hack. And, and Jamie, can you talk about BEC a bit for everybody? Yeah, sure. And, and look, it's interesting to see the comparison with identity theft. There's so much talk talk on that. But um, look, we've been working with accountants, protecting them from cybercrime since 2015 now as our core business. And, and every year it's grown. You know, every year we do these webinars. And to a certain extent, you feel like the Grim Reaper just saying, yes, it's increasing. But in 2022 and post-COVID, it's the first time that it's fundamentally changed and to boil that down, this really, it's moved from these sort of spray and pray phishing tactics. So once a firm gets access to a mailbox, a bot, then, um, then we'll just spray all of the contacts, send an embarrassing email. Somebody, you know, clients may click the email, results in an embarrassing kind of situation and creates issues, depending on what information has been divulged, sometimes ransomware has been the outcome but this is the year it's fundamentally changed in the fact that it's gone from this spray and pray approach to a much more sinister and targeted method where a human is actually lurking in somebody's mailbox and mimicking their or learning their conversation style and mimicking how they operate in order to directly either fraudulently have funds transferred via um, what we call uh, a crime breach, which is when an, um, an invoice is modified to so that a, a wire transfer is affected incorrectly or divulging passwords. So tricking, using that identity, if you like, or that email trust to coerce somebody into divulging access to their systems. Really and interesting. Yeah, look, and, and look, the, the, the thing with this is, right, the number of breaches is still increasing, but not at the rate that these numbers suggest. It's the amount of money that's being stolen that is the kicker here. Each breach harvests so much more cash for these guys. I think so. I mean, I think I think what's what we're seeing here, the data here, I think when we look at it, if we've got BEC, business email compromise here in the red box, right? If you look about halfway down that, that column, we see identity theft there. Everybody's heard about identity theft, right? We think about mm -hmm. how many taxpayers, you know, how many, how many of us have gone through this identity theft bit, right? Far too many. But we're talking about 278 million there last year versus 2.4 billion on BEC. I also think you look at it, you know, uh, with regard to, for example, almost all the way down ransomware. We've all heard about ransomware. Ransomware, 49 million versus 200, well, pardon me, 2.4 billion, right? So it feels like we're talking about an any theft, we're talking about ransomware, Ray Las Vegas, these are the penny slots, right? <laughs> these are the penny slots. But if you go about the real big deal, like you say, Jamie, it's, it's one of those deals, if somebody gets in your email, that's when they hit the jackpot. That's when they hit that's the super lotto. 
<clears throat> and I think this is this probably warrants disproportionate attention from us when we're safeguarding our clients' data, helping them safeguard their assets and so forth. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I think it's a good distinction there where we need to set when we're logically looking at how this app happens, because if you understand how a hack happens, the solution is a lot clearer and easier to work out. And when we're approaching this or, or, or understanding it, it's important to separate the payload from the entry method. We're gonna talk about the entry method, how it happens. Um, but a lot of what we're talking about here, these are payloads. Business email compromise is what you do once you get in. So is identity theft, so is phishing, so is ransomware. Um, and it's just interesting how these actual payloads are changing, but the entry methods remain the same and it's all around email. It's all around email. I think let's, um, let's go to the next slide here because I think what we know, what we know as we, as we think about this is our emails are the keys to the castle. If you have personally identifiable information regarding yourself or your firm or your clients, raise your hand, right? Is that in your email, do you have anything in there that's really meaningful? Chances are all of our hands go up, right? So business email compromise clearly is a treasure trove. And so what we're seeing is the government is taking action. The government is taking action, whether it's the, the Federal um, Bureau of Investigations, the Justice Department, the Federal Trade Commission, they're all getting in on helping us, right? Stay aware and combat business email compromise. What else do you see here, Jamie? Yeah, look, they're take, you know, they're taking action. The damage to the economy and the damage that law to law enforcement resources when these things are happening is just and also politically damaging as well, because at the end of the day, they're happening from overseas and there's nothing governments can do. And people are looking to the government to protect them from these scams. And ultimately they can't do anything, right? So they are taking these steps, they're they're really cracking down and the loss. The, the dollars speak for themselves, right? It's actually in the high 2.3s, almost 2.4 billion. It speaks for itself. And that is why this has become such a big thing and why the FBI have set up a specific task force for this. Now, they've always, always had cybercrime task force, but never before a specific task force for a type of cybercrime, such as which is what BSC, BEC is. It's amazing. It's amazing. So let's talk. Let's keep on talking about the government here for a second, shall we? Yeah, look, it's, this is an interesting one that you, you show you put in front of us, Chris, because um, it's interesting. You know, we spend a lot of time helping firms understand and protect themselves under the IRS four five five seven guidelines, which is pretty specific stipulations on what a firm needs to do in order to um, be able to tick the box on the W-12 each year and also just be able to demonstrate due process so that in the event of a breach, they are able to show that they have taken uh, preventative steps and they're going to be protected by their insurer or um, looked on favourably in any action after the fact. But this is an interesting one, Chris. I think it's fantastic. I mean, well, in the wrong way, it's fantastic. It's illustrative. It's a, it's a fantastic example of what's going on. So Jamie, as you mentioned, publication 4557, if you're a tax practitioner in the United States, you're supposed to abide by publication 4557, which has a whole litany of rules around, do not send personally identifiable information or sensitive information over email. Do not send it unless it's encrypted, right? How many people are using encrypted email both ways? It's really, really hard, but it's hard enough for us to do it as practitioners. It's even harder for our clients to say they're going to you know, get another key um, and encrypt their emails before sending them back to us, right? I mean, that's really, really big asks. But 4557 lays out very specifically the measures that we are to comply with before we go ahead and renew our license every year. Well, when we look at what they published, high bar, they're also audited. And the IRS themselves, right, when they went through the government security audit, fell short on 17 to 20. So they had a 15% pass rate, right? And we're talking about mega money, right? So the Treasury Inspector General, the Treasury Inspector General went through and said, hey, look, we audited you guys. You're failing on most counts. 85% of your counts are failing. That's how hard this stuff can be. And they've got a gazillion dollar budget. I think many of you have seen the IRS budget. It's huge, even in the worst times. It's getting much bigger, obviously, today. But it's a major, major problem, even for 
the very best funded organizations. So let's talk about, you know, probably the, the really the big elephant in the room here, which is, which is email. You know, why is email such a massive target? Why is it such a massive problem, Jamie? Yeah, look, well, I think to start the conversation, looking at it from the email provider's perspective, nearly everybody now uses either G Suite or Microsoft 365 for email. And those guys are locked in this huge battle for market share. And the way they gain market share and favorability from their client base and people who are considering user them, using them is to make sure that they appear to be convenient Okay, now the settings out of the box for both of these platforms is geared for compatibility. Okay, if you want to use a four year old scanner and use the scan to email function, they need to use protocols that are going to make it as easy as possible for you to set that scanner up because you're going to think it's user friendly and you're less likely to call them and give them and add overhead to their support function. So these platforms, and almost nobody configures them properly for security out of the box. Uh, and that is just the, that, that's the basis for why they're targeted. So the other two things are, first of all, everyone has a mailbox, okay? Everyone in the world, not just accounting firms. So if you build a solution to brute force and hack mailboxes as a, as a hacker or a criminal, you've got a huge market available to you. Um, the other thing is it's it re, it's your online identity, right? You can reset passwords. Once you get access to a mailbox, you can not only impersonate people, steal files that might be stored in attachments. Um, however, you can also um, reset passwords to other apps. So think payroll, fake, fake payroll um, that you can perform from breaching your payroll application, these sorts of things. So it's a lot of loot in the mail system, there's a lot of ways to uh, fraudulently gain cash, but it's also relatively straightforward and easy because it's geared for convenience. Yeah, I think what's, what really stands out to me in this is this idea that, look, <clears throat> these are huge targets, right? Email's a huge target, hugely valuable, huge paydays. And I think the criminal organizations that are going after it are also huge. These aren't small time petty criminals. These are massive multinational enterprises that are taking advantage. And so I think that's really, you know, the sophistication of this that continues to evolve, I think is what is probably um, the most impressive slash, slash frightening. But let's, let's get into a real life case study that you've seen, Jamie. Yeah, well, this is, a, this is an interesting one. And this supports, um, you know, we, we get tons of these across our desk on a, on a weekly basis. But this one here really shows because the interesting part here, and look, it's very gracious of this, this client to agree to share this with us, is the, the, how closely the conversation style is being mimicked. This particular person, David, always addresses Mary with morning Mary or afternoon Mary. He always, he uses the M dash there, um, which is used in this first sentence in number one. Though that piece of detail, you, you know, the amount of time it takes to learn those sorts of things, it's almost like criminal syndicates are just so much better resource since COVID. While the rest of us are struggling to find people and we're, we're in this huge war for sort of acquiring and retaining people, it seems to be the opposite in the cyber criminal world. Maybe that's where all the people have gone, Chris. <laughs> you know, every time I see a Grammarly commercial, Jamie, I think of the cyber criminals because these things used to be so poorly written. Now they can have the AI, you know, help them out, make sure their grammar is good, everything looks above board, you know, and they've got, I think they've got, they got these patterns down quite well. Yeah, well, it's that's a good one. It, it's either that, or I just think there's more English speakers out there now that are doing this. I think the rewards are there and the salary, the, the, the paydays are there, that it's attracting more than people that either don't speak English or, or speak English as a, as a very... Uh, secondary language. But you can follow the trail here. You know, they haven't jumped straight to the punch. They haven't gone straight in and gone, here's the bank details. They've actually sat there and watched the conversation. So just check with Sarah. She usually takes anywhere between 24 hours. Let me know. He's clarifying. I need you set up now this particular person, this particular business. It wasn't uncommon for them to be sending 42K to the UAE. Um, and it's very, there was a pattern of these sorts of amounts that were being transacted on a, on a monthly basis. 
And, um, and you can see the conversation here in, in number four. Have you got the details for me of an invoice? Um, now, sure he has. That's the perfect question from this, this um, hacker's perspective, which we'll see on the next slide. So you can see here, um, I can get that later for you today. Can you please organize payment details below? Now, this particular um, breach resulted in a pretty significant loss of funds and a lot of damage to this particular firm. This um, person, Mary, was actually from a third party. She, They weren't representing the same company. They have what's called a payment partnership relationship. And the ensuing damage was pretty significant. And the complexity in these situations when something like, like this happens is really making the cost go through the roof. And in, now in this particular um, scenario, what can happen is a um, litigation or action around who is responsible for this or whose insurer is responsible for this because um, there's one argument that, well, you told me to pay this cash and I did. I acted on your instruction. And the other side of the argument is, well, you physically initiated the transfer or you were gullible enough to um, initiate that transfer and actually physically enact that, that, that transfer of funds. And that makes it very, very murky and very, very expensive and very, very gut-wrenching for the part the people involved because they're already shocked, right? Someone's lost a ton of cash. You probably, it, it's a huge issue for reputation and relationships. And then also to have to go through months of litigation and then be engaging um, all sorts of lawyers and, and insurers to help out with that process. It's not, not a fun scenario at all. Amazing. I think when we look at this compared to what we saw a couple of years ago, business email compromise has been accelerating and the jackpots and the paydays are getting bigger. And I think to your point earlier there, Jamie, that the sophistication, the language skills, the patience, all these things are showing us that when they do breach email, their ambitions are much larger. I remember one of the earlier BECs we saw a couple of years ago had to do with an accounting firm. They got breached, the partner's account got breached. And what happened was they asked the part, they sent it out from the partner to the staff, hey, I want to do Christmas gifts for some of our clients. Can you run down and get, or go online and get a bunch of gift cards, scratch, you know, and then send me the codes for the gift cards so I can send them to clients. So the staff thought it was the partner and went out and did it, right? Came back, it was only a couple thousand bucks, right? But they got duped. It was a quick win, not nearly as many iterations, not nearly as much pretexting as we're seeing here, but you know, it was still, you know, quite a shock to the firm back then. But I think what we're seeing now is like they're, they're not going to satisfy themselves with a quick $2,000 hit as much today. They want a little more, in this case, uh, you know, several 20x more. Um, so really interesting to see that evolution as we go. Let's talk a little bit about what happens. What happens when um, we have these, these breaches and what the reporting requirements might be. So... So I think when we think about this, when we are breached, right? When there is an issue, um, you can go out there and you can find this online easily, but every state is different, right? And this is just in the US, you know, depending on where you are, every, every, everybody's different certainly here in the US in terms of how they think about it. In California, if you're breached, even if you don't know whether or not there is an issue, you still have to inform as quickly as you possibly can everybody who might be as affected, right? But in other states, it might be, well, it's only if it's a material breach that has a known consequence, for example. So every place is different and we have to figure out where all of our clients are and we have to start really understanding this so we can comply with the state regs and the federal regs, regs as appropriate. It makes the situation very complicated and very, very expensive. You know, so imagine this situation where you've lost funds, absolute travesty within a firm your whole firm will be up in arms and you're then having to wade through legislation and understand what your obligations are and what you need to do from a, a legislative perspective as well as protect yourself as well as um, mitigate the fallout whether that's reputation or um, relationships around the business 
um, terribly disruptive situation, Chris. Yeah, I want to come off. I'm going to come off the slide for a second. And can we talk a little bit about the insurance ramifications and how those have been changing, Jamie? Yeah, sure. And look, over time, cyber insurance policies have been increasing, but also they are now piecemealing or separating the types of cover. Okay. Now, with a standard cyber policy, you tend to get first party. Okay. You'll be covered for any damages directly to your own firm. You're no longer by default getting the first party and third party. So if somebody else has experienced damage, so you've sent them a, a nefarious email and they've incurred damage, the default standard cyber insurance policy doesn't cover that third party um, loss. A couple of other exclusions are, um, first of all, social engineering, which is what we've talked about. So that that was an example of social engineering that we just uh, we just looked at there. And what that really is, is that's being excluded from standard policy now. And it's it's an upgrade. It's it's a sort of um, not outrageous. I think, that, you know, these policies range in price depending on the size of your firm and your turnover. A standard policy on average is between $600 and $1,300 per month. To upgrade to social engineering, just as an example, is an extra thousand dollars. But the big one is crime, and that what we're terming crime, and that is when a an invoice is modified. Okay, so there's not not social coercion. Somebody has actually modified the bank details on an invoice, the wire details, and that is four thousand US in, in an average small firm. It's getting very expensive. I think we recall two years ago and three years ago, pre-COVID, the cost of cyber insurance was number three on the stack. Over the last year and a half, it's moved to number one on the stack. And now we're seeing more and more carve-outs where they're carving out what they're willing to pay out for. So the cost of coverage is way up. The quality of coverage is moving down now quite rapidly based on where the risk is. So I think what, the, what the, everything is telling us is, look, we, we have to be able to comply with what the insurance, with our reps and war, warranties to the insurance company if our coverage is even going to be in effect. And obviously, certainly prevention is obviously the best medicine in, in this case. So lots to think about here, but, but the insurance game is changing as rapidly with a slight lag relative to how the, the risk is changing. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's the canary in the gold mine. The insurers, insurers are covering themselves and reducing their risk. It's, yeah. It goes to show just how much of a risk this is. Very dynamic environment, very dynamic marketplace right now. Cool. Let's talk about how to secure your email. So I'll turn yes. to you, Jamie. Let's prevent all of this carnage from happening. Yes, no carnage, no carnage zone. So Look, I think when cloud first came about and first started entering the industry, it was all about where the data is stored. It was like, well, where's my data stored? Which state, which legislation applies to the data? It's no longer about that. It's where the data is being, how and where the data is being accessed from, okay? It's impersonating or stealing credentials, impersonating legitimate access is how data stores are breached, okay? It's not around hackers hacking through firewalls or systems. It's them finding really creative ways to steal legitimate entry, almost like stealing the keys to your house. Okay, they're stealing credentials, usernames, passwords, figuring out ways to dupe MFA, all of these types of things. So the way to help people secure their own credentials is to make it easy for them. And the way to make it easy is to give them a single point of entry. Having one um, identity to give them the one set of credentials protected by MFA, geo-locking to protect, protect against overseas access, or even restrict to a specific location if you can, if you're if a team member is only working from home um, or two locations, home in the office, or maybe even just one state in, in the US. Having those access controls and access conditions, and not only all of the controls, but also logging so that in the event something happens, you're able to pinpoint that it how it happened, who, who was accessing the systems at that time. And that is especially important in a scenario where you're sharing credentials with your client. Because when a situation happens, if, if an account is breached, automatically the conversation will be, well, 
what happened. You guys had these credentials as well. Can you show us what happened? And when you're able to pull up a log and show, well, here's how these, here's the, here's the log of all of the access from us and it wasn't anything nefarious, that just helps with that frictionless point of, um, where everybody's freaking out and going, okay, where did this breach come from? So having those controls over that single identity, but then making sure that identity covers everything, okay? And when I say everything, cloud applications, your mail platform and your desktop computers, having a single identity that covers all, rather than having to distribute all these different usernames and passwords and different methods of entry to different team members. That's what makes it difficult for people. And that's what leads to people taking shortcuts to manage that complexity. And that's what leads to breach. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. We've got to combine everything into a single, a single secure point of entry. Big challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I touched a little bit on the settings within your 365 or G Suite environment and making sure that they are locked down to only the systems that you you need. So this top one here, SMTP POP3, they are old mail protocols that a lot of scanners use. The easiest way to set up a scanner is to use one of these legacy protocols. However, it is not secure. It is very easy to impersonate a scanner as a way to penetrate that mail system. And these, you know, scanners use mail for scan to email function. It's very easy to um, impersonate that scanner or that machine and get access to a mailbox in that way. So disabling leg legacy protocols, your SMT and your POP3 need to be impl implemented straight away. And your, your um, technical contact or your IT guy needs to use, and there are newer technologies now for scanners to communicate with mail systems. Okay, now another one, the API call blocking sounds a little techy, but essentially is everyone, you know, when you go in and you um, allow two apps to talk to each other. So it might be Dropbox and Microsoft 365, you get a pop-up and it says, do you, you know, you want to be able to browse your Dropbox files from within Office, within Microsoft 365 and, and it pops up and says, do you allow and you click allow, okay? By default, Anyone within a firm can click allow, and that is really easy for scammers or hackers to impersonate. They can set up an application, looks like Dropbox, or it looks like a, a legitimate application. Somebody's trying to do their job. They just quickly click a cl allow because that's how they're geared to do so. They want to get their work done. That's a really easy way. So what we recommend is API allowing can only be to specific people within an organization. All these sound pretty techy to me. You know, you get an SMTP, all these uh, all these acronyms. It gets, I think the, the the notion that we can glaze over rather quickly immediately comes, really immediately springs to life, right? It's a lot of lot of techy stuff here. But keep going. It does, yeah. Look, online online portals, SharePoint, Dropbox, all very easy to share a file these days. Now, first of all, we recommend not to attach files to email uh, to emails to use your sharing platform but have some controls around how you share. Just right click, copying that link, sending it to somebody means that that file is available until it's disabled. We recommend forcing the creation of a guest account so you can type the person's email address in when you're sharing that, that file with a third party and that enforces them to use their email address to create a guest account. Have that file disappear or have that sh share disappear after either seven or 30 days, just so it's not online and sitting there in somebody's mailbox with a link forever. Um, so that in the event that that person's mailbox is breached in the future, those links are gone. And then also just paying a little bit of attention to your access permissions, making sure that access is on a need to know basis. The easy way to share files or share a directory or share your online storage is to just share it with everybody. So nobody has any trouble taking the time to get a bit more granular over who needs access to what is, is really important in order to protect your files. Great. Great. Let's talk about email shielding. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, obviously stopping those mails from coming in a big way that mailboxes are breached is from, people clicking a link or people receiving a nefarious email, having some um, scanning and some um, rules around that. So 
gray list. So, you know, by the by default, we recommend blocking access from specific countries. There's 120 countries around the world that we block by default. Um, further, um, when, a, when a, an email domain or an email is on a gray list, having rules that are going to move that to a second folder, like your junk mail or your clutter folder, where you can actually, all of the links within that email will be disabled so you can check it. Um, and also just having these verification rules so that users are notified. There's a notification that pops up saying that, hey, this is a new contact. This person has never emailed you before. Be careful when opening that email. All of these sorts of things. Stop that front first base or that front door entry of emails coming into your firm because people are busy, right? They click, you know, they, they need to open emails, they need to do their job. And we need to put protections around team members so that they can do their job with more confidence and not have to be as kind of worried, I guess, on a day-to-day -day basis about security. Makes sense. I think a lot of this has to do with, we have to have the right environment, we have to have the right conditions, right? Email is not going away. Um, I think you said a bunch of pieces and that really resonated, Jamie. You know, one of them was this idea that people are moving quickly. People are moving quickly, right? It's nobody's fault if we're, we're going quickly and just hit allow. I think it's, the buttons look attractive. They're designed to, to look more clickable, right? Even, even in um, legitimate tools, legitimate tools. So it's what's gonna happen. So I think there's this idea that really when we look at, at the problem set, their context matters. Um, and I wanna put something in front of everybody here, which is really this idea that there are patterns out there today that work. There are patterns out there today that work, right? And, and banks were earliest targets of all this. Banks have all the most meaningful data in the world, right? They have the money. Um, and so what do they do? Well, what they did was, and this is, if you look at the date here, Fe February 13th, 2007. February 13, 2007. This is a long time ago. Right? Bank of America to launch mobile banking. Customers be able to use cell phones to check balances, pay bills, and transfer money. Well, this wasn't necessarily something we pinned on our refrigerators back then. But if you think about it, if you think about it, it really teed off this bit where we feel very secure with our banks today because they are managing the security, right? They are keeping us in keeping our money where we want it, which is in their possession, right? And they've got us into a habit that we really, really like because it's easy and because it's convenient. We on our side as clients aren't scrambling to take all the necessary steps to keep ourselves secure because the bank already did it for us, right? And so if we think about that, you know, this is a, this is a data point from 2021, right? So this number is even higher now, but 85% of deposits are now made digitally at Bank of America as growth in client engagement with digital continues. So the underlying fact pattern here is a super majority of every age group, of every demographic is using online banking. And they're doing it in a way where it's all happening in network. So Jamie, I think a lot of things you're talking about with how to really kind of take care of email, you know, limit access, limit countries, verify authenticity of sender, all that kind of stuff, right? What's happening is we're creating an environment where the nefarious actors simply can't get in as easily, right? So there, I think there's two ways to look at it. There's email as a, a, a medium that we have to nail down. And then there's also a secondary layer we can have, which is move in network, move in network, give your clients a place where they can work with you outside of email that other people are not invited into in the first place. Cause anybody can send you an email theoretically, right? Email is developed to be an open standard. Well, we can actually make it a closed loop, a closed environment with them. And so how we think about it is, you know, can you give them a super app? Can you give them a super app where it's all the communication can be in one place and they'll expect to work with you here just like you would expect to work with your bank on the app. For example, if your bank sent you a, a note today via email saying, hey, um, let's start talking about your bank balance and your account numbers, you're probably gonna look at it and say, that looks pretty suspicious because we do everything in the app, right? So the context and the habit have changed. They've moved outside of insecure email to secure in-app experiences or in on browser experiences, right? 
So way, one way we can think about it is make it super easy for your clients. Just like with your bank, offer biometric login. Biometric is inherently much difficult, much more difficult to hack than a rainbow attack on passwords. Give them tasks, right? Everything you do there is gonna be super organized. So now, because they go there to see what they owe or see what they need to give you, et cetera, now you've got them in a habit of going there, just like you have a habit of, um, you know, with your bank to go deposit checks there, check balances, et cetera. Give them a document scanner. So just like we're gonna deposit check using a scanner on our phone, if they need to send you a document that they got a, a paper copy of, they open their mail, oh, this needs to go to the accountant. Instead of putting it in the shoebox, they just go ahead, use the scanner on the phone, send it to you, and they can recycle the paper right there, right? So convenience helps build the habit, right? <clears throat> Give them signatures. If they need to sign something, don't send them a link that they have to click on through email because links we know are dangerous. Send it to them in the same place they do everything else. And of course, after they sign it, that document's gonna be put in the file storage on their device next to the documents they scanned you, next to the tax returns, the financials you've delivered to them, et cetera. All the storage gets unified for them. Way more organized, far less confusion, and far less security risk. So there's a bunch of ways to really kind of think about this and attack the problem because we don't want to have all this information sitting in email in the event that there is a BEC, right? So let's go ahead and, and keep them out in the first place as best we can, and then put a secondary wall in there, which is even if they get an email, which we have to use, there's still a secondary wall where clients mainline um, repository for documents and so forth, and all the good stuff is sitting in another system altogether. Same thing goes with payments. We know they want the money, right? So instead of payment links and so forth, we do the same deal. Allow them to pay in-app, in this case, just using Stripe, right? They can go ahead and put their credentials in here securely. It's all PCI compliant, off you go. So all in one, just an awful lot easier. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and, um, and if you want to go ahead and actually judge this, you want to judge this versus we might be doing today, we've got a pretty cool quiz. Just go to lissio.me, lissio.me, backslash uh, CXAT. And that's our client experience quiz. It'll go ahead and it'll send you how you're doing relative to best practices. It just takes about maybe 90 seconds. Okay. And Jamie, let's talk a little bit more about practice protect. Yeah. Um, look, over 20,000 accountants use us now, and ultimately with cybersecurity specifically for the accounting profession, okay? And, and the way we do that is technology, but also compliance. We talked a little bit about the IRS 4557 um, guidelines. We help firms become compliant with that and being able to kind of cut to the chase because we know accounting firms and we only work with accounting firms, it cuts a lot of the consulting overhead or that kind of, um, you know, we kind of know pretty much straight away where a firm needs to sharpen up on their, their cyber defences. So it cuts a lot of the cost and a lot of the conversation and a lot of the overhead from a time perspective from the accounting firm's plate. And essentially we can cut to the chase and provide a solution around the compliance, reducing risk around IRS 457, but also having the technology tools so that you're maintaining control over data and also protecting your risk against cybercrime. Now, at the end of the day, our team members, whether they are in the office, remote, out of state, or even out of country nowadays, um, team members need to have access to client data in order to be able to perform their duty to the firm and that needs to be done in a controlled way and ultimately that's how practice protect helps accounting firms and how we've been growing so rapidly in, in mitigating the risk around the profession now i can safely say that the accounting industry accounting and bookkeepers are the most protected um, professional services industry now there's so much diligence and so much caution around how client data is managed um, we're, we're making inroads into protecting the profession and, you know, it really does show the, the, the numbers that we're getting and how firms are, are moving here to how successful this is becoming. This makes so much sense. I mean, 20,000 is a big number uh, and growing, obviously. And I think what's so impressive is that as, as the industry continues to evolve, continues to think about this, um, 
as insurance pieces start to move, it it seems inevitable to me that everybody's going to lock the barn door closed to the bad guys as best they can, given what's at stake and 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 the even just the, the raw cost of insurance, right? We'd love to talk to you. So um, you can do a demo of the platform and understand more about what it does or contact me directly. My email address is there. I love hearing from everybody um, to just understand more perspective and, and field any questions personally. So feel free to shoot me an email at jamie at practiceprotect.com. Very gracious, very gracious. So um, fantastic. We've got um, time here for questions and so forth. I know, um, uh, there's probably a number of things about how, you know, we always get a lot of questions about how, but Allison, um, would you mind uh, helping us through kind of QA, Q and A and so forth? Yeah, the first one's coming in from Marilyn and she's asking how she can get her clients to stop emailing um, sensitive data. So I think it seems just to be a problem with practitioners that they just, their clients refuse to use their sensitive methods. We, I think we do not go a single webinar without hearing this question from someone. We so perhaps you can help Marilyn understand what she can do there to get her clients to actually. Um, I actually have a suggestion once you once you do yours, Chris. Sure, sure. Well, I think um, I think the shorter answer is uh, you got to make it easier. The second you make it easier than email, you win, All right? So many of you probably have clients who are asking text you or actually actively texting your cell phone. They want to do that because it's easier. And if you think about how the world is, continues to change, email used to be for our best relationships. And now I don't text, I text my best relationships. I don't do anything with them over, over email. So we're constantly in this, in this state of movement. I think if we think about where everything is going to be in the next several years, it's, it's, all, moving, it's all moving towards private channels, right? Um, whether it's WhatsApp, you've seen a whole bunch of them already kind of come up. Email is always gonna be there. I think you might have clients that will always want to work on email. That's okay. But I think the idea is over time, you want to build a bridge to where you want to be, right? And I think having really important client data in email and all that, e all that data for all your clients in email is probably, you know, I think we would agree that that's suboptimal. You want to build a bridge where you are today to where you want to be tomorrow. <clears throat> and the software providers, the CEO included, we're all working to make sure that when your client gets nudged over there and they try it out once, they stay, which is exactly what happened with like Bank of America and Chase and all the big banks. Almost everybody's using them today because they're simply better. The experience is better, right? And so that's what I would, I would always say, build a bridge, we'll make it really attractive. We'll continue to make it more and more attractive. And you'll see, you know, we'll quickly get you to 50, 60, 70% adoption. Within several months, once people understand and keep on getting nudged, they'll say, oh, this is better. And they'll just be there. But you don't have to twist any arms. That's what I'd recommend. Yeah, and I think I think one of the suggestions that we've had from people is Linda Artisani says, well, if you're refusing to use my secure method, you know, I've given you Lysio, I've given you the option of encrypting email, I've given you my secure portal, then I'm going to have you sign my security waiver. <laughs> and no client will sign it. So that's a, that's a good one. Um, there was a question that came in um, from Jonathan, and I think it's best uh, it's best uh, for Jamie. How do you think about the client experience when you're locking down your firm? It doesn't Convenient. affect, practice protect doesn't affect the client, does it? It's sort of invisible, right? It's not anything the client. Right, yeah, the client, yeah, the client's experience isn't impacted by practice protect at all. But I think the point that's being made there is, it's got to be easy. You can't affect anybody's experience. You, if you can make access easier, you make it more secure and they can, go, they can go hand in hand. Yeah, and actually this just, this just literally just cues up Margie's question. Um, Chris and Jamie, how do you complement one another with your services? Is there any overlap? And um, well, we'll, we'll use guys, we'll, have, we'll wait for guys uh, question after you answer Margie's. So how does Practice Protect and Lysio work together? Jamie, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I, I haven't really thought about that because I don't really see any overlap at all, really. Um, Practice Protect is about securing access to applications, your mail platform and your desktop computer and having a single identity around all. Um, we actually integrate with Lysio via the um, 
the Microsoft and Google identity system. Whereas, yeah, I'll let you explain Lysio, but I don't see any overlap happening there at all. That's right. And I think Practice Protect is really <clears throat> going to make sure, you know, your firm is, is tip top in terms of, of how it's protected. I think when you think about Lysio, we're really about client experience, right? And so we want your clients to have the most amazing experience, which includes security. How is your client experience? How can we say you have a good client experience if we've got all sorts of important information sitting in their email box as well as yours, right? And how are we going to give them really, what would happen today, we can look at it another way, what would happen today if, if the bank said we can no longer use their online portal or mobile apps to do banking with them? We had to go back to email, what would happen, right? We'd switch banks. Um, so. When we think about that, we think about the client experience and, and security being a part of that, I think we love talking about security because it really matters. It's going to make a huge difference for everybody involved. Um, but it is it is um, complementary to what Practice Protect does. Yeah, I usually, when I'm talking to people, usually describe Lysio as an A-N-D, an and, to everything you're using. I imagine Practice Protect is also an and. It's 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 a just do. It's You add on to everything else. Um, Margie has a couple of comments here. They're not questions. Firstly, she uses Lysio. Yay, Margie, thank you. And then she also, this is for Jamie, she had a great presentation from John Milloy from Practice Protect to the Woodard Austin Group last week. Jamie, we wanted you to know he did a fabulous job. That's always nice. And then this one is from Guy. And Guy is asking, um, Jamie, would you please summarize what Practice Protect provides? And is it practical for accounting firms with less than 20 employees? Sure. Um... Thanks, Guy, for your question. And, and Margie, I took a screenshot that from that and sent it to John. So thank you very much. He'll be he'll be very happy with that. He'll be happy with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Guy, ultimately, for, on the tech side, putting the compliance aspect aside, um, we're the identity guys. Okay, we provide an identity service around your cloud applications, um, both client and internal. Your mail system implement all of the protections that we talked about, and also your desktop computers. So team members have a single identity that can be accessed via MFA or a passwordless, where they can scan their phone, uh, scan a QR code on the screen. Ultimately, that's what we do now. Um, we talk, SMB firms is is where we play. You know, generally a large firm with fifty or more team members, they have internal IT departments that handle these types of scenarios. We're the identity guys for small firms who don't necessarily have that level of internal expertise around cybersecurity and managing access. So um, jump on, you can do a demo uh, and, and you'll be able to see sort of what it looks like and how the platform works. We'll also be at QB Connect next week. Yeah, QuickBooks Connect will be a good place to see both of these apps in action for those of you that are coming. Um, Chris, this next one I think is for you. Although Jamie, if it, if it applies, um, jump in. Um, Shannon is is saying staff are having a huge issue with having to look in so many places for documents and information. Does Lysio solve this for your for my firm? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think client experience and firm experience go hand in hand. If you imagine the banking experience, I go back to the banking because the patterns just are, are so similar. If you work with your bank and you want to check your balance, you go to one place. If you want to get a tax form, like a 1099 INT, you go to the same place. If you want to get a statement, you go to the same place. If you want to deposit a check, you go to the same place. And so there's this idea, <clears throat> what's this idea of super apps, right? Super apps in the banking world are, are very clear and very valuable. I think in the accounting world, <clears throat> we've fragmented everything so much where texting, email, portal, electronic signature solution, right? Just um, different email, somebody else's email, uh, you know, telephone, et cetera. There's too many places to go look. And so really we have to start to take that perspective from both the firm side and from the client side and say, look, this needs to get unified. So with Lysia, we didn't talk a lot about today, but we have email integration. So we'll bring your Gmail or your Outlook at email in, into it. We have text alerting, we have tasks, we have a scanner app, we have document storage and exchange, we have electronic signatures. You get all this stuff all in one place. So instead of saying, hey, did we ask the client for it and having to ask your peers, for example, you can go to Lysio and say, yes, we created a task for them. You can see who created it and when it was created. Did we send them that file or did you receive that file? Same thing. You'll be able to see everything in one place by person 
and by account. So that's really, that's really the key to efficiency. And when you start to do that, you start to realize, hey, instead of searching for stuff, when you sit down, actually, you can see everything. Um, pretty significant productivity gains on top of the security aspects. Yeah, yeah, really, it's just creating that one place to look, isn't it? And then being able everybody to share and it being really secure. Um, Jamie, I think this question is best for you. Is are there any tips you can give us to ensure that there's no one in our inbox now? <laughs> yes. Um, that one from Andres. I thought that was a good question. I think he yeah. means has, how do we know if we've been victim of a business email compromise now yeah. or implement MFA straight away is my advice. If you don't have it, if you want it in a nutshell have that third factor, username and passwords are just not secure enough. And um, yeah, getting changing your password is, is a basic minimum, although you need to have MFA and that's going to lock out anybody who's lurking in there right now. So you would recommend having everyone change their passwords now, like to a strong password and then also in implementing MFA. MFA, yes. Multi-factor, okay, great. And the longer a password, the better. Um, if you use a phrase, so instead of, you know, a daughter's name, let's say the daughter's, uh, you know, whatever the daughter's name is, one, two, three, my daughter's name is having a longer password. It's far mm -hmm. harder to brute force. Bridge. Or the initials of, you know, my daughter, Sarah, loves cupcakes with sprinkles. Perfect. Even but better. But the initials, right? And then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or using a, a password um, vault, I think also is 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 one that you could use as well, couldn't you? But really, really, people should get a consultation with your team, right? And then I think there's, because you go through, what's your process to bring? This is actually me asking a question. I'm sorry, because I'm just curious. What's your process when you onboard a new a new firm? Sure. Well, that that initial demo, we understand the applications that a particular firm's using. So for, whether it's for practice management, um, how they're interacting with clients, all of these types of things, and then provide a demo of how our platform could solve any of those problems. Um, but you do learn a lot about cybersecurity. It's, I guess, similar to um, this is kind of level one, what Chris and I have spoken about today. One of those demos will take you through to level 10 in understanding how it happens. And I am a true believer that understanding how hackers get in, how mailboxes are breached, makes the solution so much easier. It makes protecting yourself so much easier once you know that. Great. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. I've got one from Samantha that I'm going to answer. It's 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 a little esoteric about uh, about her about Lysio. Um but are there any last minute tips and tips or, or, or things that you want to leave the audience with? We had a great engagement from the audience. So it's really thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Nobody asked what uh, Jamie's uh, daughter's name is. So that's a good thing. <laughs> um, I really appreciate everybody turning out um, today. And um, certainly we want to be helpful if anything pops up, if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate. Um, so just as a wrap up, I wanna thank Chris and I wanna thank Jamie and Justin for their time today and also you. Um, I think it's a it's a journey. Um, you know, everyone is always learning and you can get tips and things and then also set yourself on the right path for uh, 2023 and, and really the, the sense of relief that comes when you've locked your firm down and don't have to worry about those sorts of things. Um, so for, for follow-up, we'll be sending an email out tomorrow with the, um, with the recording and a, and a PDF of the deck and, um, and then feel free to get in touch with everybody. Really appreciate it, everyone. All right. Thank you all. Nelson, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thanks, Cheers, guys.